All right, so just to make sure we're all in the right place, we're here for essential security patterns. We're gonna talk about what are some of the things that we can do as a small team, as a team that doesn't necessarily have a dedicated security person, what can we do today to get started and make sure that we're thinking about security from the start? We'll run through some of those controls that we can put in place, and we'll also do a bit of a demo as well about how some of those work. Uh, now's your chance to leave the room if you've made it to the wrong session. Um, otherwise, we'll kick on. And I'd like to start by sharing with you a, a moment of inspiration I had the other week. I was in the park and I was eating my sandwich and I thought to myself, sandwich is just a bit plain, it's a bit bland. It needed something just to spice it up a bit. And I had a brilliant idea. I think we should start a department of pepper where it's our job to provide the taxpayers of Australia with pepper on demand with the press of a button to wherever their location is. And I'd like to invite all of you to come join me to form this new department of Pepper. And we're gonna be successful for a number of reasons. First of all, we're gonna leverage service providers. If that provides its own challenges in itself in that we're outsourcing some of what we're doing, but it allows us to move quickly by leveraging their expertise. And we need to think about what is the impact of that on our security. We're gonna run an efficient team which means that we're probably gonna be wearing many hats and we're gonna to need to do many different things, um, but it also means that we need to make sure we're making the best use of our time. And we're also gonna keep our costs low. If it's not helping deliver pepper to the citizens, we don't wanna spend money on it, right? And as we're doing that, here at the Department of Pepper, I'd like you to think about security and all of the stakeholders that are involved in our department, in our uh, offering, they need to, we need to think about the security for them because they've all got a right to that. For our users, it's embarrassing when you're caught without Pepper. We need to make sure that the information that they give us is protected. For our providers, well, we're gonna be tracking their location so we can efficiently route the Pepper to be delivered. We also need to do a lot of background checks. We need to think about how do we keep the information that they're giving us secure. And we need to think about it for ourselves as well. As a government department, there's a lot of scrutiny on us. We need to make sure that we're thinking about security and we're ready to react. We've also got a lot of proprietary information in there as well that we need to protect. And here at the Department of Pepper, that all starts with the culture that we put in place. As you can see, we're a pretty small team here. We're gonna be wearing many hats. We're going to be doing lots of different things, but we don't have a dedicated cloud security person, which means if something's no one's job, it's everybody's job. We all need to think about security as we're building out our features. And as we're building out those features, we might be comfortable with the idea that something's not complete until it's tested and in production. We also need to think of it not complete until it's tested and securely in production. Building the security up front into those features as we build them out is a lot more efficient rather than trying to add it on afterwards. Security isn't a separate requirement, it's part of the requirement of the features that we build. And some of those different things that I want us to think about as we start building out our secure security is to think about our environment. How do we start with a secure environment that we can build in? How do we separate out our duties? Although we're wearing many different hats, how do we take, make sure that we're taking deliberate action to access different areas of the system, to do different roles within our organization? And then we need to think about monitoring. How do we look at what's happening within our environment from a security perspective? And how do we ensure that the controls that we've put in place are working? And once we've got that foundation in place, what can we do to ensure that we're building a secure application on top of that? Let's start with our secure environment. We're gonna use AWS, and the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with an AWS account. What are some of those basic controls that we should put in place to make sure that we've got a secure environment? Well, to start with, we want to enable multi-factor authentication. And if you're familiar with the Australian Signals Directorate Essential 8 patterns, one of the patterns that it talks about is enable multi-factor authentication. We want to enable that um, both on our root, which is the first user that we get, because that root user is very powerful, and we also want to make sure that all of our users who are logging in and accessing our environment are using multi-factor authentication. A username and password is not enough to identify that user. They also need another token that we can identify them with that's constantly changing. And as I said, that root account's very powerful. 
We don't want to use that as part of our day-to-day -day tasks. We want to lock that away, keep it secure, and only pull it out in emergency situations. The other benefit of there is we want to make sure that we're using individual users so we can track when actions are taken in AWS, we can identify it with a single user who did it rather than a shared service account. And ideally, we want to federate our identity. We've already got some identity stores within our organization. When somebody joins the Department of Pepper, the first thing we're going to do is give them a Department Pepper um, email address. And when they leave, the first thing we're going to do is take that away. By federating that identity, we don't have to have two separate processes for keeping our users aligned, and they can log into AWS using the same credentials that they do for their email. And as we're building that out, as we're enabling that federation of identity, we need to think about what roles are we giving people, and ensuring that those roles are scoped down to the least privilege that that person needs to do their job. And the last one that I want us to think about as we're building this out is disabling public buckets. There's now a tick box in, in AWS to be able to prevent S3 buckets from going public. And the benefit there is that we have to take very deliberate actions to make information that we're uploading into Amazon S3 public. It's a very simple guardrail that we can put in place to think about how we make information available. And we don't just have to use one account. We can set up multiple accounts and have those accounts there for different purposes. At our top level, in our organizations account, the only thing we want to use there is AWS organizations, which will allow us to invite accounts to join us or create new accounts. And that's where also that account is where we'll set up our federated identity. From there, users are going to switch into accounts for the specific task that they're trying to achieve. We don't know exactly what we're building to start with. So we might start with a sandbox account, and that sandbox account allows us to log in and do anything, right? So we can play around, we can experiment, we can try different ideas. And then we've got what I call a set of core accounts, for example, a security account. And that's one that we want to lock down quite strongly. We want to make sure that we have to take on the security role to be accessing that account. We want to lock it down such that objects can't get deleted from that account. We want to, and that's where we're going to put our secure audit logs and things like encrypted backups. That's where we're going to uh, put some secure information for our organization. The other one that I'm putting in that core accounts bucket is that, or that OU, that org unit, is the shared services account. And that's going to be very important when we're dealing with external service providers. The shared services account is what they'll be using. We expect them to be checking new versions of their code into some tooling that's in that shared services account. And from there, it's going to get pushed out into individual accounts for each of our environments. And here, we're doing that because we want to, A, we want to make sure that we can um, test at scale in our test account and understand what the impact to the production is going to be, but also because it's a very coarse uh, boundary that we can implement in terms of control. In our development account, sure, we want to be able to log in. We want to be able to turn things on and off so we can develop, we can work out how that works. In our test account, maybe we scope that down a bit further and we can only access logs to be able to diagnose what's going wrong. And then in production, well, we don't want anybody accessing our production account. We want to keep our users away from our data. And having that coarse-grained account boundary allows us to do that. So what does that look like? If we jump over to the first demo, maybe as part of the Department of Pepper, one of those things that we need to think about is um, having a uh, IRAT protected status. So now within AWS, there's a number of services that are available um, to have as uh, IRAP protected. Um, but there's only a certain list of services. So if we look at our IRAP compliance um, website, there's a lot of documentation which is really useful. Have a look at Artifact as well, which has a bit more sort of information about this. As a federal um, agency, this is something that we may need to implement. But if we have a look here, and we have a look for which regions and services are covered, I notice two things. So first of all, it only applies to the Sydney region. And secondly, there's a list of services that are in scope for that compliance. If I have a look here at the services that are in scope, there are a whole bunch of them. Wouldn't it be great if for those accounts that are under our application org unit, we limit it such that to start with, they can only use these services in the Sydney region. Now, with IRAP protected, that doesn't mean that we can't use other services, but this is a good baseline to start from as we start building. 
When we log into our single sign-on portal, you can see I've got an account here. I've got access to a number of AWS accounts. I'm gonna start by going into this small teams demo account, which is the root account within my organization. And once I get into the console there, I'm gonna to go to organizations, and within organizations, I can apply service control policies. And those control policies are going to control what we can uh, set up within our organization. So if I have a look here, under my policies, I can create a new policy. Well, I wanna create a policy that only allows access to the Sydney region to start with. So here's one I've cooked up earlier. And if we have a look at what this actually does, it's going to deny actions that are not any of these, that are outside of the, um, if they're not in this region, okay? Now, I've got these ones here. These aren't, um, these are in that list of IRAP protected services, but these are global services. We need to be able to access these outside of the Sydney region to use them. So I, what I can do here is I can uh, save that policy and then I can create a second policy that's only gonna allow those IRAP services. So again, if I start here, nice and conveniently, there's a, another policy here that I've got. And again, if I look through here, this is very simply, it's going to deny anything that's not one of these actions. And these actions are all of those that were in that list of services in scope for our assessment of the IRAP protected status. So once I've created those policies, I need to apply them to the uh, accounts within my organization. As you can see here, on the left-hand side, I've got a, a tree of um, organizational units within my account, and I can select the application account where we're gonna develop our, our um, application to deliver that pepper, and then I can try, apply service control policies. So I can attach the IRAP only, and I can attach Sydney only. Now, as we go along, we might assess and we might find that there's other services that we want to use, and we can change our posture. But to start with, this is a really simple set of controls that we can put in place to, to think about how do we start putting some guardrails in place. I know that if my application can make it into production, that I'm only using those set of services. If we can cut back to the slides, please. What we've looked at so far is we've looked at how do we build our secure environment when we sign up for our first AWS account, what are those baseline con uh, controls that we should be putting in place? And we've also looked at how we can separate out our duties, both by applying least privilege when we federate our identity and also by having a multiple account strategy where we can have different accounts for different purposes within our organization. And the key here is that everything that we've looked at so far doesn't cost us anything more. We've done this in a way that is very cost efficient and it's an effective use of our time. A couple of minutes there to apply those service control policies and I've now got a posture to start looking at building a, a workload that could be IRAP compliant. So what about monitoring? When we talk about monitoring, we're looking at monitoring to understand what's happening with our, in our environment and we're also there to ensure that, we're compliant, that our controls that we've put in place are working. A great tool to get started with is AWS Security Hub. Security Hub provides us with a simple compliance dashboard that shows the overall status of our account. This is one of those services that's not IRAP compliant, but we can go away and we can have a look at that and we can assess whether that's a good fit for our organization. We can look at what additional controls do we need to put in place in order to use that. And Security Hub looks at a number of different sources. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Amazon Guard Duty. Amazon Guard Duty is, is uh, on that IRAP protected list, and it provides us with, it's a machine learning service to look at what is the baseline within our account, and when things start to stray from the baseline, it'll uh, set up alerts for us. And it does that by looking at our DNS logs, it looks at our VPC flow logs, which are like network flow logs, and it also looks at CloudTrail. CloudTrail is another one of those services that we need to think about um, that is IRAP protected that we should definitely be turning on and having a look at. It turns out that the WS in AWS stands for web services and that everything that we do within AWS hits an API. Even if we're clicking around in a console, that hits an API. And most of those API calls are logged against CloudTrail. 
By federating our identity down to individual users, we can use CloudTrail to see who's doing what within our account. And GuardDuty is able to analyze that data, understand what normal behavior looks like, and then prevent, present alerts when it strays outside of that. For example, if we've got a developer who is trying to escalate their privilege and give themselves full admin access, GuardDuty picks that up and creates an alert for us. The other sources of information for Security Hub is Amazon Macy, which unfortunately isn't available in the Sydney region yet, but that's a service, that's another machine learning service that looks at, um, identifies potential personal identifiable information within our account, and also can uh, alert us to possible data exfiltration. And AWS Security Hub also looks at Amazon Inspector. Amazon Inspector is a tool that allows us to look at the network reachability of our instances, and via an agent can also pick up CVEs that are running on the box. Now, as I said, these tools are gonna help us get an idea about what's happening with our environment. But it's also important that we understand that the controls that we have in place are working. So Security Hub also adds compliance checks. And those compliance checks are rules that we can set up to look at what's happening and are the right controls in place. For example, there's an AWS foundational benchmark available from the Center for Internet Security, which is a list of 43 rules of baseline foundational security things that we should be setting up in our account. And those are gonna surface through Security Hub to provide us with an overview of what our compliance to those looks like. And when we talk about monitoring, it's a journey. When that user initially escalates their privileges, well, guard duty is going to raise an alert, and we could go in and we can regularly check guard duty. But if we go and check that once a week, and it's been a week since that happens, that's past when it's, it's occurred, right? We, it's too late to take action. When we think about monitoring, let's think about how we can push those alerts out. Get that alert that has found that somebody's trying to escalate their privilege when it happens. So we can go and ask them, hey, what are you trying to do? Do you actually need that access, or are there other mechanisms that we can use? And then once we understand what our response to that alert is, ideally we want to automate that. So lock that user off from being able to access the system until somebody can go in and, un and um, unblock them, right? That we can verify that that person has a valid reason for doing that. So we've looked at how we can build the baseline of a secure environment. We've looked at how we can separate out our duties. And now we've also got some monitoring in place that's going to look at what's happening with our environment and to check that our compliance controls are working. And again, we've done this in a way that's cost and effective, and it's been an efficient use on our, of our time. So we can focus on delivering that pepper to the taxpayers. So how do we start then looking at building a secure application? As I said, we want to be thinking about security for all of our features as we're building them. And the simplest way is to look at when we're using a service within AWS, what security features are available. I don't know exactly what our, our Pepper application is going to look at, but I think this is a good start. This is just a, a simple reference architecture for a multi-tier web application using a number of different AWS services. And again, we can look at the instructions and we can look at what, serve, what features are available for those services out of the box. CloudFront, for example, allows us to lock down where we serve traffic to. It allows us to protect URLs through signed URLs or through a secure cookie. Our load balance is gonna sit within a security group, which is like an a instance-based firewall. And we can control at that layer what other services it's allowed to talk to and, and can talk to it. With Amazon EC2, when we're running resources in our AWS account, rather than using long-lived credentials, we can assign a role to that EC2 instance, and that role then gives it access to other resources, for example, S3. So we don't need to store a long-lived key and secret key, we can use roles instead. And then with Amazon S3, we can put bucket control policies in place to control who and what is allowed to write to that, that service within, or within that bucket. Um, RDS is our, Amazon RDS is the relational database service, and that's where we can store our database. The controls that we've got there, is, you know, we want to make sure that that's in a private subnet. We can apply a security group to that. But also, depending on what database engine we're running within there, that engine's going to have additional security features too. As we turn these services on, we can look at what security features are available and just start using them. 
And then we can look at what additional services are available that can further raise our posture. The AWS Certificate Manager, for example, allows us to generate a TLS certificate that we can apply to our CloudFront distribution or we can apply to our load balancer. And that automatically rotates for us. We can very quickly start to encrypt all of our data in transit. We can also look at AWS Key Management uh, Service, KMS, which allows us to create um, encrypted uh, data. With our um, RDS instance, for example, or our EBS volume, that's just the tick box when we create those services to integrate it with KMS. If we need to do further levels of encryption, our um, application running on EC2 can talk to KMS to do field level encryption. And so just by using those two services, we've now enabled data in transit and data at rest. So again, what does that look like? How do we just use the service features that are available to us to start to build something. One of those things that I talked about was, uh, I talked about CloudTrail, which is our, our audit history of who did what within AWS, and I also spoke about our security account. So how can we put those two pieces together? How can we build a secure data bunker for those logs just using the features that are available? Well, to start with, let's log into our security account. First thing I'm going to want to do is create an S3 bucket that we can store those logs in. So let's create our bucket. We want to make sure that it's in the Sydney region. Um, let's call it Dear Pepper Cloud Trail. Now I could just scroll down and hit create and get a bucket. But we're looking at what features are available to us out of the box as we create this to ensure that we're enabling our security. Well, if I hit next, well, I can keep all the versions of the object in the same bucket. That means if somebody tries to modify the file, it's just going to create a new version. It's not going to replace it. The other thing I can do under advanced settings here is I can permanently allow objects in this bucket to be locked. And we'll see how that gets configured in a second. And I want to encrypt them as well, right? And integrate with, um, let's just use AES256 for now. This is that block public access that I talked about. It's just a checkbox there to make sure that our audit logs aren't going to be made public. And we can create that bucket. And again, if we click through to that bucket, there's a whole bunch of properties that we can set for those. I talked about object locking. This is one that we want to enable. Um, we can either, either enable it in governance mode, which we can go in and modify those if we need to, or we can enable compliance mode. Because we don't want people deleting our audit history, I'm going to create a compliance mode bucket. I'm going to ensure that all our cloud trail logs are retained for at least 30 days. I can also modify the permissions. Well, let's edit our bucket policy. So our bucket policy tells us what can write to this bucket, what can read from this bucket. And this is the bucket policy that I want to apply to that. So if we have a look through here, what I'm saying is that, the, that I'm going to give um, this service, CloudTrail, access to re the, the access control list of our bucket and this specific bucket. And I'm going to allow CloudTrail to put objects into our bucket, into this specific bucket, under AWS logs, OK? And so now, just using the features that are available out of the box through reading the documentation, I've worked out, well, what are some of those security controls that I can put in place to lock that down? And then we can look at, well, how do we enable CloudTrail to send uh, logs to that bucket? If I log back into my root account, this is where I need to set up CloudTrail. I want to apply it to all regions, even though we're only building our application in the Sydney region. What happens if somebody logs into one of those other regions and tries to do something? I want to log all of those, and I want to apply it to the trail to all accounts within my organization. So I set this up once, and just using that feature, it's going to apply to all the accounts. I don't need to create a new bucket, because I've already got a bucket available to me that I've provided access to um, CloudTrail to be able to write to. And I can hit Create. 
And again, that's a, just a really simple quick step that I can do to quickly get moving, and I've now got an audit history if um, something should occur to be able to diagnose that incident. And the last thing I just want to do there as well is um, I want to make sure that um, users logging into those accounts can't disable CloudTrail. The documentation is really useful here. So if we look under the organization's um, documentation, service control policies, there's a list of example service control policies for us. Looking through the documentation, the very first one that they give us is to prevent users from disabling CloudTrail. Because I've read the documentation, because I'm just using the features that are available, all I need to do is copy that across. Uh, again, I can uh, create a new policy. with the example policy that's just going to deny users from calling the stop logging function. And there we go. Now the key one here is, I'll just call out as well, that we want to apply this to the root account. So that other one, those other policies that we looked at, we applied those specifically to the application. This is one that we want to apply to all accounts within our organization. So I can also apply it at the root level. And if I look at the service control policies there that are available for root, I can attach that keep cloud trail on. So that's going to apply to all of the accounts within our organization. If we can just flick back to the slides, please. So there we go. We've built that secure foundation to start with. And then as we start building out our application, it's a matter of looking at what controls are available to us by reading through that documentation and by looking at what additional services can help us. And again, we've done that in a way that's cost efficient because we're just using the, the features that are available to us. And it's an effective use of our time because we're doing it at the time that we build rather than trying to add it on later. And we've spent some low effort here. And what have we got out of that? Well, out of doing this, We've got a protected root account. The root account's really powerful, and we've now locked that down. Because we've federated our life cycle and we're using individual users instead of a shared service account, we've got to use a life cycle for our AWS users that is in line with the life cycle for the rest of the user identities within our organization. We've put some basic guardrails in place by ensuring that when we federate our identity, we're implementing least privilege by applying service control policies, by using multiple accounts for different purposes and putting the right guardrails in there. And then we've got some basic monitoring in place should an incident occur to be able to keep an eye on our environment. And if something should occur, we've got that information available to us to be able to start diagnosing that incident. There's another page within the documentation. We've got a service called um, AWS Athena, which allows us to create SQL queries on data in S3. And within the Athena documentation, there's specifically a page on how to query CloudTrail logs. So if we've got an incident within our organization, we've got those CloudTrail logs in place, we can use Athena to immediately start looking at those and diagnosing what happened. Now, we're all here to learn. Here are a couple of breakout sessions that I think are relevant. Uh, John's going to talk about AWS Protected later today. I touched on that a bit today, but to really understand what that means and how we can leverage that for our workloads, go to his session this afternoon. Uh, Racer and Sarah actually are going to be talking about security at the speed of cloud, which is all about, um, as an organization, how do, does uh, our operations and development work together to ensure that when we're applying that security, it's there to actually help our, our users. And lastly, I spoke a lot about building out uh, a multi-tier web application, but um, this session this afternoon with James is going to talk a bit more about what that looks like from an API perspective, which might be a different pattern than we can apply. And the last thing I want to leave you with is this. I talked about a lot today around what we can do for the Department of Pepper to get our security started, and I've put all of that together onto our, uh, one of our GitHub repositories into a quest. That ties together a bunch of labs, and it ties together as well some of the documentation, so we can get out and get started with this today. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm going to wander over to the protected booth, so you can find me there for the next half hour. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining me. <laughs>